And now, on Talk Birdie to Me, it's time for some bonus content. All thanks to our good friends at Ping, they'll help you play your best. You can see your local golf shop or professional for a Ping Club fitting. And the Golf Clearance Outlet, great prices on great gear. They're in Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane and Perth or online at golfclearanceoutlet.com.au. Now, now, now. now, time for some bonus content. Here's Nick O'Hearn and Mark Allen on the most listened to Australian golf podcast. This is Talk Birdie to Me. Well, sometimes the stars align. This is Masters Week. We had an email asking us about uh, how you become a caddy and things involved because there are people out there who would love to have a crack at being a caddy and uh, being a full-time caddy, particularly with the amount of money that we see rolling around the world. So we went straight to the top. Simon Clark has been doing the yardage books on Australian tournaments for a long, long time. Uh, he is highly regarded in his field, so highly regarded that he is actually catting for Jasper Stubbs mm. this week at Augusta, Nick, which is uh, our amateur who won the Asia Pacific Amateur Championship at Royal Melbourne. Spot on. Yeah, I can't wait to talk to him. I want to know also some of the players he's caddied for in the past. Yes. Because we had a bit of the controversy there. Well, I'm not sure. I, I'm <laughs> not sure that he did. I think it was Bussy after thinking okay. about it. I think uh, Bussy, so not Chopper. Not not uh, Simon Clark. I think Bussy caddied for me, okay. and I ha- sacked him pretty early. He he went on to become a very very good caddy. <laughs> he's done very well, Bussy. <laughs> well, well, let's give him a call and uh, and see if he's uh, see if he's around for a chat. Hello, Simon. We've done the intros. We're all set to go. Thanks for joining us on Talk Birdie to Me, the Masters Bonus Pod. But it's also the Caddy Bonus Pod. Mm. So you're ticking a couple of boxes for us, Simon. Okay, cool. I like ticking boxes. Hey, first of all, I said last week uh, on the program that I might have sacked you, but after (laughs) very early on in your career... (laughs) I wish I got the chance for you to sack me. (laughs) I I, I said that, but after some consideration, I think it was Bussy, one of your mates, who uh, went on to become a very good caddy. Yeah, it was Bussy. Yeah, he rang me the night you sacked him. He was in tears. (laughs) (laughs) I find that hard to believe. (laughs) (laughs) Now, the, the reason why we got you on is because of this email. Now, Dan, can you read the email out once again? Yes, I can. So we had an email from Mitchell, uh, and Mitch said, Hey, guys, Mitch from Southwest Sydney here. I've only been playing golf for the last three and a half years. My handicap is 8.1. Pretty good. Yeah, I would love Mm. to know if becoming a caddy or studying to become a caddy is a genuine career path in Sydney. Uh, I don't have too many connections in the golf world, but I'd love any tips or recommendations on, on where to start. So let's start this off by, Simon, how did you get in the caddy? Well, I heard a quote once from a man named John Elway who played for the Denver Broncos, the Mm. quarterback, and they asked him how he started off in football, and he said, you fake it till you make it. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. And look, I watched Augusta, to be honest with you, was was the first time I'd sort of looked at what was going on there, and I just thought, how on earth do those guys get to do that? I just thought that was the coolest thing in the world. Um. And then I ended up going to Japan to, I answered an ad in a newspaper to work at a country club in Japan. Wow. Hmm. As a house caddy with my wife, actually, with my girlfriend at the time. And there was a tournament on down the road about three months after I'd started at the country club. And Craig Perry was playing in it and Wayne Smith. Hmm. And the course I was at sort of got wind of that and they were contacted knowing that there was foreign caddies at the course and could they come caddy for those two guys. So I caddied for Wayne Smith and the other guy there who was Mark Creelman, his name was, who oh, played nice. off two at Royal Melbourne, caddied for Craig Parry for the week. I remember Mark. Yeah. Oh, incredible. And, and that's how, that was my first pro tournament and I just, yeah, I, was, I, I fell in love immediately with it. And I said to Wayne Smith, this is really cool. Can I come back and work for you next year? And he said, yes. And back I went and that was how I started. So, because there is no other way to do it, is, is there really? You guys would know that. But you're actually correct. I mean, there is no, you can't look up a, a website or anything like that saying, hey, I want to become a caddy. Although you told me the other day when I spoke to you uh, earlier, Clarky, that uh, you're writing up a, a program for an elite caddy program. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, I've written it. Yeah, I've done it for Golf Australia. I've done a intermediate. Mitchell's a perfect candidate as an eight handicapper he'd be your fir- perfect candidate for the intermediate course if you know what i mean and then i've written an elite one as well it's three days basically okay um and it involves you know yardage books and, and pin sheets and what have you and 
and when to speak and when not to speak. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Clarky, being a caddy at a golf club in Japan and then moving on to being a caddy for Wayne Smith is an enormous jump. Uh, you know, what the locals... It was very much so. So what, what was the most confronting thing once you got to the pro level? Not knowing what I was doing. <laughs> you know, um, caddying for members, obviously, at a country club is a completely different kettle of fish than, than a pro tournament. But Wayne was so patient. And this is probably a lesson to pros. So I'm doing some work for Golf Australia at the moment about the transition from amateur to, to professional ranks, whereby... As an amateur, you play the game. It's such a unique sport in that you play the game by yourself for so long and then all of a sudden you have no choice but to have a caddy once you hit the pro ranks. Um, and so that transition's hard for the pro himself or herself. Um, I mean, how do you do it? Who teaches you how to do that? And, and some people really struggle with that, as you guys both know. There's guys out there that don't really handle that transition well and don't use caddies very well. The biggest thing... Well, from a player and a caddy's perspective, especially in that first week, is patience because you're really just trying to feel each other out, what the player likes, what the caddy does. Uh, I know with my, um, you know, caddy Wilbur, who you who you'd know, uh, you know, he was on my bag for for many many years. I know Wilbur well, beautiful man. I mean, the the, the first week that he caddied for me, funnily enough, the first hole he, he stood behind me because I'm a left hander. He's so used to uh, caddying for right handers, he put the bag on the <laughs> on the uh, on the right hand side rather than the left hand side. So he's looking at my butt for the first yes. few shots, which was quite funny. But uh, <laughs> yes, but uh, I mean, how do you go about? Uh, you know, from your experience, the best way of sort of uh, figuring out what a player wants and needs at the pro level. Um, well, now, I mean, I've done it now for 30 years, um, which is obviously a long time, you know, and, and even myself, when I start working for someone for the first week, you, you, you go out there and you watch them. You don't really go out and say, you, I mean, you have to be a chameleon to start with. Don't mm. you? you don't really say, this is how I caddy, you know, because you have to adapt to how you guys play. You observe for quite a long time, you know, for, yeah. for the first few days. And, and you ask them how they like it. How do you like this done? I mean, I worked for Todd Hamilton for quite a long time. And if I put the club in the wrong section of the golf bag, he would get irate. <laughs> That's funny. You know, so, so as you know, some guys are very fastidious mm. and very, um, I probably can't use the other word on, on radio, on <laughs> podcast, but you sort of have to really adapt. Um, yep. And, and you have to have someone who's, well, it helps to, for the player to be very patient and, and, and that's what pros, especially young pros, struggle with is all of a sudden they're having to teach someone how they want, you know, how they like it when they've done it by themselves for so long. Yeah. So I, I would say you have to observe uh, and then it doesn't take me long now, but pretty much after 18 holes, I can tell where you, you know, how you hit it, where, you know, how far you're going to hit it. Yeah, for sure. It doesn't take me too long now, but when you first sort of start, you know, and, and I just think pros need to be um, patient with caddies that are young and up and coming because mm. there's not many there's not many young and up and up and coming anymore. No, that's true. Especially Australians, it's a very hard job to do as an Australian, unfortunately. Yeah, it's kind of an inner circle out on tour these days with the caddies. I think where uh, yeah, a lot of the top caddies, especially they they just switch bags as you go along. All the top players, it's kind of, it's like a circle of uh, of, of musical pop- chairs. Yeah, exactly. Yes, very much so. Um, so, so tell me, uh, over the years, I mean, who are some of the players that you worked with out on tour? Um, oh, well, I caddied. Well, Todd Todd was one of the first. I, I started with uh, Wayne Smith, and then I worked for Roger McKay. Oh wow! Graham Marsh. Nice. Brian Jones in Japan, and this is the cool thing about golf, isn't it? Really. Caddies transcend generations. So I sort of started with guys much older than me, and now I work for guys much younger than me. <laughs> um, and that's been a nice journey in itself. You got you got some ripper blokes as well. Yeah, yeah, they were funny, and they were really funny men. And and you you sort of realise really quickly with guys like Brian Jones and Stuart Gin and whatever is, you just shut your, <laughs> you just shut your mouth around them when you were, when you were young, and you know because they can tear you to shreds if you pipe up at the wrong time sort of thing so there was a there was a fair bit of that going on when, when you're teaching caddies these days you actually mentioned something there professionals using caddies well so i, I remember whenever i picked somebody up at the start of the week I, I would say listen we are a team perfect thing to say a lot of people think that golf is an individual sport but we are a team and you know i i always admired your relationship 
uh, with Wilbur. Mm. You guys were a team, weren't we were, you? One hundred percent. Yes. So that you, you'd give them that little speech on Monday, um, and then the next thing was I wanted them to do yardages for me. I, I didn't want to do mathematics before every shot. I, I, I didn't want to do it, but. I think you've got to find professionals, and this is probably what you've got to teach some of these kids at Golf Australia too. If you're trying to train a caddy, um, I, I hate seeing the caddy and the player both doing mathematics before they hit off. I mean, me to too. me, it's just wasted. Yeah. Um, do you see kids who are, I guess, uh, just entering professional ranks? I, I know it's hard for them to let go and trust the caddy. But, gee, I believe it just gives you such a clear head before you hit. When you become that computer, you know, you're just being fed information by your caddy who you trust. And then you just turn around yes. and, and turn in the shots. Is that what you're trying to teach everybody when you're getting in between players and caddies? Yeah, 100%. And you're also, you, you are trying to alleviate them of that responsibility of the mathematics involved in the game. Because, as you both know, it, it is a very mathematical game. Mm. Certainly at the top level, it's it's all it's not all maths, but there's a lot of maths for layups and, and, and what have you, and not every player wants to do it. So if you can take that away, and by the way, Mark, saying that at the start of a relationship with a caddy is the best thing a caddy can hear, that we're a team. I mean, it's quite rare to hear that. Um, but I, I think they're better these days on that level. But I, but conversely, the thing, that's, the, the thing that I'm finding now working with the Golf Australia kids is they use lasers so often that they don't use yardage books when they're younger, right? So mm. when they come to and, – and, and I spoke to Connor McDade about this recently. He said, when I got to the Australian Open, it was the first time I used a yardage book without being able to use a laser. And he said, I found it terribly confusing, you know. And Wow. So that's kind of going backwards on that level. And it's like when you get to the top level, the laser goes in the locker. Yeah. And, and everyone's playing these days on the Aussie Tour and whatever, under a million dollars or whatever the rule is. You know, they're all just shooting the pin all the time. But when you get out there, all of a sudden you have to f develop a new routine on, you know, how, how am I going to pace this number? What am I going to do? You know, how's that done? And they don't know how to do it. So that's something I'm working on as well is trying to get instill in them. You have to have days where you play without the laser and you, you get a pro yardage book and, and work out how you're going to do it. If you know for when you make it, prepare for when you when you're going to make it. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is Masters Week. Uh, you're there caddying for Jasper Stubbs after he won the Asia Pacific Am. Now, what does your uh, preparation, I guess, look like? Practice rounds. Have you got any big name players lined up for uh, for those rounds? Uh, or we've been trying. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm assuming. I mean, one of the best things I ever did. Uh, the first Masters I went to, I went to the caddy master there. I can't remember his name, but I said, who's your best green reader? And he said, oh, that's, uh, that's Curtis or w whatever his Curtis name was. was. Yeah. Right. And I said, right, I'm taking him. He's coming out with Wilbur and I, and he's coming for 18 holes. As he, he's going to show us these greens. He's going to tell me where the pins are going to be, so all, the, smart, all the breaks. Mate. And it was, the, yep. it was the best money I ever spent there at Augusta because they showed me the greens yes, exactly yes. how you know, where so everything smart, was going to be. So, yes. I mean, you, you have obviously you know the greens pretty well. What's your preparation, uh, you and Jasper, look like? So, so Jasper was fortunate enough to come here in February and played – Two or three practice rounds with a with a house caddy nice. that that, that showed him where all of it, and, and that just alleviated so much of the shock that you get when you first get to Augusta mm. because it gives you a big shock whether you like you know whether you like it. It's a good shock, but it also <laughs> um, sort of detracts <laughs> detracts from you know what you should be doing on, on those times. So we went out there today, and I've got to tell you, in the all the years I've been caddy, I've been here twice before. Um, today was one of the most special days of my life, and his as well. We, we played the back nine today at Augusta, and we spent three and a half hours playing it, and there was no one out there. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Just you guys? Yeah, it was, it was really quite special. Uh, we ended up getting caught. The guys caught up to us. Trevor Immelman caught up to us with a group. Um, Peter Melnati, and they were the only two guys we saw all day. Super. It was, and you know, and and that's, and look, as I said, I've been here twice before, so I've heard the sounds and the noises when the gallery around, but... When he was hitting drivers today on 11, um, 13, the sound it makes when there's no one there, the echo through the trees was actually, yeah, I can still hear it. It was pretty cool. Um, so I just set up where all the pins were, yeah. you know, and, 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 and we just putted. He just putted and putted and putted and shipped and shipped and shipped. It was really cool. Beautiful. How, how good is it on that 12th green? 13th tee, the new tee, which is further back. How does that look from back there? Oh, it's funny you say that. Have you seen it, Nick? How far back they've taken that? It's a, it's a fair way. It's like thirty, 
it felt like 30 or 40 yards. Yeah, well, they went into the, but Augusta, lined yeah, the Augusta Country Club, didn't they? The next golf course to, yes. to put it back there. Oh, but they've lined it with these most, I guess you'll see it on the coverage, all those beautiful flowers and whatever. And as we're walking out there today, I was like, I feel like we're walking into a wedding, like married <laughs> to a site. <laughs> <laughs> it just is the most beautiful place in the world. And as you know, the gallery can't go back there. So it's, a, it's quite a hallowed little position back there. Tell me this. I, I was gonna. I'm, I'm really interested to hear from your perspective as a caddy, Simon, and then Nick's perspective from a player. I want to just talk through some of these holes, and I'll give you what my perceived um, uh, biggest obstacle is on each hole, and you tell me what it is from your perspective. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd love to do this after the turn. So uh, we'll just put out here on nine, and I'll see you both on the tenth tee. Sounds good. Sure. Thanks to Ping, they'll help you play your best. And the Golf Clearance Outlet, who search the globe for golf's best deals. This is Talk Birdie to Me. Now back to Nick O'Hearn and Mark Allen. Welcome back. We're talking to Simon Clark, who's caddying for Jasper Stubbs this week at the Augusta National Masters Tournament. It's a big week, and uh, we're so lucky to have him, and we wish Jasper Stubbs very, very well. Okay, let's get through this golf course. Uh, my perceived hurdle on the first is just the nerves on that tee. <laughs> now, uh, what, what what is... You know, I'm talking about the entire hole. Maybe it's the green, maybe it's the fairway trap. What was the trouble, Nick? You're exactly right. Yeah. Four, please, Nick O'Hearn driving is the call from the, <laughs> from the men at the Masters. Uh, the, 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 the fairway bunker on the right-hand side obviously avoided all costs. It's really that green is so much more severe than what you can see on the television. Um, if anything... You want middle of the green all day long, and you can two putt from there. Hopefully, if you go long on to on the first hole, you are absolutely dead. And I'm sure Clark, he can tell us that right. as well. Well, well, we'll do every second hole. So, okay. Clarky, you've got the second. Sure. Um, sure. Uh, the perceived at this par five around the corner. I, I reckon if you can't get there, then it would be the layup trying to get on the right side of the fairway. What, what, what's the what's the process on the second hole, Clarky? Yeah, it's it's pin it's pin dependent on the layup. Obviously, when it's right, you're trying to lay up a little to the left, and when it's left, you're trying to lay up a little to the right. But if you get a good drive away, you're going, you're you're trying to get it down there. You know, you're just trying to obviously avoid that bunker, and you're hoping to get a shot away that that you don't have to lay up from. Mm. Um, but if you do have to lay up, you're dead right. You, you know, it's all it's all dependent on the pin. It's not a tough layup, um, and if you do hit it in that trap, it's you know, you're not going to get it as far down as you'd like. Um, but if you can get it somewhere near the front edge down there, you're, that's what you're trying to do. All right, the third. Uh, I imagine it's just club selection uh, on standing on that tee. I, I imagine you'd have your hand on the three iron, the three wood, and even the driver some days, Nick. Uh, never driver for me because I could never take the bunkers out of play. The longer hitters, if the pin's up the back, yeah, then they'd take driver, get it towards the front of the green. Not too difficult to pitch up there. It's a bit of a blind one. But mm. any time the pin's on the left, you need a full shot coming in because it is so hard to get the ball stopping next to that flag. Can I just can I just quickly, can I just do some homework, Nick, on yeah. that? Because I did that. I think that's one of the only holes out there that begs the question. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so much of that course... You know what you're going to hit and you know what you need to do. But four is quite special on that and it is where the pin is. When yep. that pin's tight left, yep. how far back are you liking to lay up? Because Jasper was kind of against that today when I talked about it on the range. So he was trying to get he it. He said, oh, I don't want to be too far back there. You know, He goes, I don't want nine iron in there. So I'm just, help me, help me. <laughs> yeah, for sure. What's the start of the fairway bunker on the left? How far is that from the front? I haven't got the book in front oh, of me okay. right now, but it's it's generally two iron or driver, isn't it? You know, you're yep. trying to get it two thirty, or you're trying to drive it down there. He wants driver to the right pins. Yeah, for sure. I think driver with the back right pins. Um, anything on the left, I, I always laid back to wedge or nine iron for me was fine. And I'm just basically hitting it, you know, middle of the green, and then working it right to left down the slope. So a draw for the for the right hander and. Look, don't get greedy there. Four's a good score. Yeah, that's I totally agree. Thank you. Let's move ahead to the long par three, fourth hole. Now, this is just hit. I mean, I, I, from the new back tee, it's just a monster hole, Simon. So um, I, I'm just trying to work out. And it was a monster before. Yeah. Is it, is it just a matter of working out where not to hit it on this hole? Yeah, yeah very much so. If that pin's right, you find a lot of guys will just go left and, and take their chances to be putting it from a fair way away. 
um, yeah, it's not something that it, you're very, very happy with three on that hole. And obviously, if it starts blowing against the wind, it's even a bigger monster. Um, you certainly don't ever want to have a wood into that hole. But if it blows hard against you, that, that might be a possibility these days. Lefts is a friendly, friendliest hole, uh, friendliest pin. Fifth hole, long par for dog leg to the left, Nicholas. Once you get the drive mm. away, uh, when I've been there, the false front looks like it's a real dangerous spot. Yeah, cannot come up short there or right. It's absolutely dead. For me, being a shorter hitter, I really struggled to hold the long irons in the green. I actually, the spot I was aiming, I was just trying to put it in the back left-hand bunker because from there it's an uphill bunker shot, easy up and down. If it happened to stay on the green, fantastic. For longer hitters with shorter irons, well then, mm. I always say to them, look, be long rather than short, because short on five is dead. Yeah, okay. Uh, another par three, the sixth hole. Uh, for people who haven't been there, there is a gallery in front of the tee <laughs> that, that you can't see. It's so <laughs> steep on the way down. You're actually hitting over people yeah. who are watching the action on the sixth green and also at number 12. Uh, if the pin's back right, Simon, I don't know what you're saying to a player because I reckon club selection would be the number one. Well, for sure. You, you can't go long there. And you, you know, in practice, you really just got to hit a lot of putts up to that back right pin and, and try and get a feel for the speed. The first time I was here in 99 with Brant Job, I'll, I'll never forget just the steepness of those tiers. Um, I was whole, I was tending the pin at the back right because he, he spun off to the front edge, which was about 80 foot. And I'll never forget holding the pin. And, and as he was lining the putt up and, and addressing it, I could actually see the top of his head. That's sort of how steep it is. <laughs> and I just remember thinking, like, I've, you know, I've tended pins before, but I've never been able to see the top of my player's head. Um, <laughs> so, do you know what I mean? Uh, very, very good. Yeah, I do. I know exactly what you mean. I managed to get the pin out, after, you know, with that thought didn't linger that long, but... Uh, it's, yeah, you don't go for that one. The other ones you can sort of go for, it's a great hole, and it does give you a fright when you don't know the galleries there when you first see it as you yeah. walk down, and, and there's thousands of people on that hill. <laughs> All right, let's move ahead to the par 4 seventh. I don't know. I mean, there's so many challenges here. I, I imagine the one thing would be in my head was not to go long on that hole. Number one priority, find the fairway. If yep. you don't find the fairway, what you're trying to do is basically put it in the front bunker so you can get it up and down. Yes, if the pins on the left are very, very difficult up and down from that front bunker. If it's on the right, you can use all the slopes and all that sort of thing. But if you find the fairway, it, it's all pin position dependent. Like most of the mm. you know greens at Augusta National, you're correct. If you are long, well, you know, may as well write five, maybe even a six on your card and go to the next. <laughs> yeah. All right, the eighth hole, the par five. There's a big bunker on the right-hand side that I imagine if you can carry, that's a, a nice one uh, if you can carry that trap. Simon, I know, I'm know i going to say turning the ball right to left around the corner trees for your second shot. Yeah, you can hit either shape down there. Depends on what you're comfortable with. Um, you're just trying to avoid that bunker. I mean, if you hit it in that bunker, there's only one, you know, there's only one way to play that hole from there. But if you get a good drive away, you're having a crack at it. Um, and the, you know it's it, the layup's not that hard at, out of that bunk. It, it's quite straightforward as far as holes go there. Um, but if you can have a go at that green and get it somewhere up around there, you're a very good chance for a four. You you know it, it's, it's a hole you, you you're happy to make four on and fives. You know it's a it's a par four and a half. Okay, ninth hole, uh, Nick. I don't know how many times you drove the ball to the flat to have a shot that wasn't off a downslope going up a hill, but I imagine that would be a priority, get yeah. it down as far as you can. Length is a massive factor there. You just get it as far down as you possibly can. I never could get it down there, so my second shot, <laughs> I was actually, Wilbur, a couple of times you said, just hit it in the gallery on the right. It's an easy up and down from over there. <laughs> if, you hit in the, if you hit in the left bunker, le left bunker is really difficult up and down, unless the pin's on the far right. But, um, yeah, again, sometimes that's one hole where if you do go long, uh, it is possible to get it up and down with a back pin. But if your back pin, sorry, if it's a middle or a front pin, if you go long, then you're, you're really going to be have your issues. Right, out, let's get to the 10th hole. And Simon, I don't think people understand uh, from the tee to the green how far downhill it is. But I'm going to say the drive is the most important. Oh, absolutely. And, and it's, it's generally a three wood. I mean, if, you know, talking with no wind, we played today with no wind. Um, and he didn't really hit a great three wood down there. He sort of pulled it a little bit and got got plenty on it still, and it was still fine. It's actually there's there's more of a margin for error there with a three wood than you think. Um, you, you can take it right and sling it around that hill. It's one of those holes. It's kind of like just funnels. Doesn't funnel to the same spot, but it will funnel. You just got to get something on it. Um, 
but the drive is too much generally for these guys and they're all just trying to get it down the hill but it's the second shot and the slope it's this right to left slope of the second shot in that, that you've really got to practice that and and aim it out to the right because the whole green slopes right to left and hard downhill as well um and guys have missed it left you can't miss it right in that trap we missed it right in that trap today the first shot he hit and it's and it's one of the hardest bunkers i've ever raked to be honest you don't know where to enter it from um but yeah missing it slightly left is okay on that green you're happy with four there and we hit a few putts to Adam Scott's pin today. Oh, nice. And, at, and uh, Steve Williams was right. It is two cups. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that hole because it asked, uh, it asked two questions. One off the tee is right to left for me, a little low running fade. And then the second shot was a draw being a left-hander. Oh, yes. Sorry. For yeah. me. So for a lefty, it was yeah. actually an easier second shot for, than for a right-hander. And what would you say, an easier tee shot than a right-hander, Nick? As far as that goes, I love a low little running cut as a lefty with the driver. So that so it's not a hard tee nice. shot for yeah, me. I, yeah. Cool. Okay, let's tiptoe into Amen Corner. Nick, uh, you get on this 11th hole oh. and where they've moved the tee back. I feel like they've moved the back 100 metres, <laughs> but uh, I'm going to say the, yeah. the second shot, just don't put it in the pond. Yeah, well, I got there one year and I said, this looks different to me on the tee. And as when I went back into the club, they said, yeah, they uh, they moved the tee back 30 metres. And I said, well, it looks exact. It, you know, you can't tell. And he said, well, they don't just move the tee back. They excavate the entire hill, which is what they did, yeah. what they'd done. So I'd never saw the green for my second shot. I only ever saw the top of the flag because I couldn't get it far enough down there off, off the tee. So that second shot, when you can't see the green, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> with, the, with a back pin, the, the, the one place you can't go is long right with a back pin. Pin. Yeah. Front pin and long right's okay. It's still not great, but you're always sort of playing right and short of the of the, yeah. of the whatever flag you have there. Yeah. Superb. All right, let's get to the twelfth tee, and it's all on you, Simon. I'm so glad you've you've got this <laughs> hole because club selection, mate. Club selection. But Marco, can I quickly say on the eleventh, yeah. the first time I ever caddied round there was 1999 with Brant Job. We played with Craig Stadler and Larry Myers. Wow. And I, I asked Larry Myers, I'd, I'd, we'd, I caddied for Brad Hughes and we played with him at Turnbury. So I knew him and I said, Larry, guess what you're doing for me today? <laughs> and he said, I know, Simon, I know. And it, he didn't even, we didn't, and when I, we got to 11, he took out four balls and he took me to the spot and then chipped them all for me and commentated each one. Wow. That was my nice memory. On did he get close? Did he get any of them? Did he get any of them he close? He said, he said the first one, he goes, that would have been short. The second one, he said, that would have had interest. And the third one, he goes, that would have gone in. <laughs> yeah, he loved it. He said it all changed a little bit, but he was just so gracious about it. What a lovely man he is. Right, right. right. I want you standing on the 12th tee, uh, and you know there's breeze, but you don't know where it is. What do you tell your player? You don't know where it is. No. I mean, you're trying to look for clouds. I was looking for clouds today, but there weren't any. You feel all kinds of wind through that whole corner. Sometimes it's against, sometimes it's following. You've got to just try and, on days like today, where it's not blowing that much, but it's there's something there, you've just got to, you've just got to go with almost no wind and trust it and hit the shot. So Jasper hit the 9-iron. The pin was back left today, and he hit it to four centimetres. Ooh. So, so we got one. lucky, and it was... But the thing about that green is the middle section from you just after over that bunker to the back edge of that is only eight meters long. Mm. Like it's just yeah. so narrow in that middle section. That's interesting because and if the pin's right, hit it left, hit it a little bit left. You don't have to go. You don't have to stiff it to that right pin. It's just not necessary. It's interesting, Simon, because so many people look at that hole and say just hit it in the middle of the green. But if you do hit it in the middle of the green, you've, you've well, got there is no middle. Yeah, that's mm. right. There's nothing there. Well, it's a left-handers hole. Yeah. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is too. It is too, isn't it? Righto, Nick. Uh, you've just birdied the twelfth. Yeah. Uh, you're in contention, and you've got thirteen coming up. What are you thinking on the tee? Well, I'm just trying to hit that, you know, right to lefter again. Use the slope. Which for me, and this hole sets up perfect for a long hitting left hander. Unfortunately, I I was not. I was a short hitting left hander, so I had to lay up more often than go for it. But if you can get it far enough around, the issue on the second shot is the ball is so far as a right hander above your feet, yeah. and you're hitting to a green which goes from left to right. So it's two opposites working against each other. It's one of the the greatest second shots in golf, but mm. at the same time, the mm. most difficult second shot in golf as well. So, Simon, you're, 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 the, you're, you're our eyes and ears on the ground, and that you did mention before that the tee's gone a long way back. Is it driver now? Because a lot of players would hit the three wood. But... Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's easier, mate. They've made it easier. I really? Think. Why? Um, yeah, we, we lasered those trees straight ahead today, and they're like 285 metres straight ahead, whereas... Oh. 
in the old days, it was it was a decision, you know, and they were slinging three wood around there, and the hill's so steep there that it just the driver pops into it and just stops. So unless it's downwind, it's driver all day long. If if you just go driver left centre, you know what I mean when I say left centre there. Yeah, yeah. So you're not going really close to the trees, but you're just kind of going at a left centre uh, uh, yep. target. What would that leave yep. you in? What what sort of yardage would you have in? Jasper had two twenty five meters to the pin today from just going left center. Exactly what you said. And what's he hitting? And obviously the lies. Was it you, Nick, that told Jasper about to practice that shot? That that's not only downhill, like it's obviously side sloping, but it's also pushing you forward. Yes, correct. So he's been practicing that shot. Oh, great. So that I reckon it was you. Uh, anyway, he hit a hybrid today to four feet. Which is one of the best shots I've ever oh, seen I'm, in my life. I'm going to take credit. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I did tell him uh, <laughs> yeah, to practice that. I probably did. My memory's <laughs> shocking. <Pretty sure. laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> we've got through Amen Corner nicely, and we get to the 14th hole. Now, no bunkers on this hole. No. So, what are you looking for? You're looking for a right to left shape off the tee to hold the to hold the fairway. Otherwise, you've got to flirt with the left hand trees. And if you manage to keep it in there, the only place you really want to miss this green is little long right. Because mm. from there, it's kind of back uphill. And if the pin's on the left, it's just an uphill sort of putt or chip from up there. That's no problem. If you're short of this green, it is death once again. So long better than short. Mm-hmm. Simon, you, you just handed your player the driver uh, on the 15th hole. Where's he aiming? Yep. You take a run up at it and you just smoke it down the middle. <laughs> it's actually a friendly tee shot. It's a friendly tee shot. And and, and should you miss it in right or where, the layup's not that hard. But Jasper hit one and pulled it a little bit and it kicked down to the left and laid up with a nine iron to eighty yards or eighty metres front. But if you get one down the middle, you're hitting you're hitting an iron into the grain. A long iron, clearly. But it's but it's it's a friendly it's a friendly tee shot. And you've just got to take enough club to carry that water, don't you? Yeah. If he had three wood in, would you give him three wood or not, or would you tell him to lay up? No, no, I, I wouldn't. It would depend on the no, not a, circumstance would depend. If it's Sunday and you're three behind, yes. Yep. Okay. Um, if it's Thursday, no. It's Friday, no. Um, Good call. Yeah, three was not a great <laughs> three was not a great club to hit into that green. It's it's <laughs> it's not a big target, and it's just as treacherous behind that green chipping down towards the water. It's not not that much. I mean, it's you know they're great lies and what have you, but it's still not a friendly shot. All right, Clarky, let's get you to the 16th tee, and you're in contention. Yeah, the order's been mixed up. Oh, we have. Yeah, That's okay. <laughs> the order's been mixed up. You're in contention, Clarky. Yeah, it's Nico. Nico's got this one. You're in contention, Nick. You're in contention. Is it Sunday? It's Sunday. Okay. I'll, yeah. I'll go with this one. Six, yeah. 16. 16. You're in contention. We all know the pin. Yeah. It's the back left pin. Just aim 20 feet right and hit the shot that you'd... As Tom Weisskopf said to, about Jack Nicholas, hit the shot that you know you have to hit. <laughs> or whatever he said. Stay down. Accelerate through the ball. Yeah, that's Your it. destiny is right here. <laughs> yeah, you're just trying to feed it off. And if you happen to, as a lefty, see, again, 12 is a left-handers hole, 16 is a right-handers yes. hole. Yes, that's so true. Every now and then, I'd pull one right. I hit it up there a couple of times on that back left pin, and yeah. you have no chance. The only, you can, the, only, mm. the only place you can have is about eight feet left for par basically, unless you hit the hole. So, yeah. Yeah, as a right-hander, it kind of makes you look good. That that It can yeah. make you look good when you've actually bailed, you know. You, well, you're better off being in that front bunker with the left pin rather than going to the right because it's an mm. easy up and down from the front bunker. You just knock it 15 feet mm-hmm. past, it rolls back to the hole. Pretty simple. Okay. Yes. Uh, 17. Uh, now, it's the back right pin, uh, Clarky. Uh, do you need to be on one side of the fairway or the other for that pin? Well, that bunker in the front of the green, and that, by the time it's Sunday, and it's going to be 29 degrees apparently on Sunday, so that's going to be baked out. Um, so I, I don't think there's a really – probably the left side's a little better, but not by much. Um, there's only – from that bunker to the back right pin, there's only about 12 yards or, or 15 yards maybe at the, at the very most. Middle of the green, mate. It's not, it's not something you can just flat out go – middle of the green with a little cut. You know, we'll, we'll we'll sort of slide it up towards the hole, but that that's just a red light pin. You know, that's just danger. Yep, long is no good. Yeah, you just can't miss. You can't miss that fairway left for a start. Right's a little better than than left, and that you can get it up and down out of that front bunker. But if it's going to be baked out and it's downwind, it's just about the most impossible pin on the golf course, really. Mm. 
All right, Nick, you're on the 18th tee. Mm. They've moved it back 50 metres from the good old days, <laughs> and it is the tightest shoot in golf anywhere in the world. How are you feeling? Sounds like a par five to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. You, you talk, I was talking about the limbs uh, in a previous part about how they, they, sh- they shade the inside of the of the pine trees and all of a sudden that tee shot becomes very very narrow so if you happen to find the fairway that second shot is so much more uphill than what it looks on tv and i've hit shots in there thinking you know to back pins oh that's perfect and it comes up on the front and then i've had the front one thinking well i've got to take the extra and you go up the back and then that's dead as well yeah. so it's that's such a hard second shot that the shots that you know scotty and cabrera hit remember you know that was amazing. Cabrera especially in the yeah, rain unbelievable that was one of the greatest shots i've ever seen on that hole in the rain and in the moment. Give us your thoughts on 18 as well. Uh, we talked about it. I mean, obviously, we just played it this afternoon and it was and it was pristine conditions and what have you. If it's downwind, you can't. You just can't go in those bunkers. You can, you can still make birdie out of those bunkers. It's not ideal in, to be in them, but he kind of wants to take them on and sort of slide it up, slide it just slightly up there. And I, I kind of get that. You don't want too much club into that no. hole and you sort of have to back yourself with the driver, but yeah, yeah, we hit it long today. The pin was back left, um, and we got a gust of wind that just puffed up, and he pitched a pin high, and it, it was probably six six or seven yards out the back door, which isn't treacherous to that back pin, but it's still not ideal. You just can't short side yourself on that hole, really. Yeah. yeah, and the weirdest thing about that green is the front half, that's not a problem. The back half of that green, that top tier, is the hardest green or part of the green to read on the golf course. Mm. It goes every which way. Very yeah. difficult. Yeah. Hey, Clarky. Finally, like I said, you're our eyes and ears on the ground. I, I've heard the course is going to be playing reasonably firm this week. Uh, we know traditionally that uh, the Masters people who organise uh, the golf course from Tuesday, Wednesday to Thursday, Friday, uh, quite often they flick the switch. Uh, what do you think? What sort of a golf course are we going to see this week? Yeah, I think they're going to get what they want this week. I think um, the, the, the guy that shuttled us, shuttled us up to the 10th tee today said they're only – concerned about two or three hours rain on Thursday and the rest of the rest of the week is pure sunshine. So I think they get to do what they want this week and I think it'll get quite fiery by the weekend and um, I don't think you're going to see 16 unders and 18 unders. I might eat my words, but uh, yeah, I think it's going to be fiery and, and, and quite difficult and you're going to have to hit, you know, dinner plates on the gr- dinner plate size targets on the green with the right shape on them to get it anywhere near it. Yeah, and typically what they do there is Monday they get it nice and shaved and firm and then they slow it down Tuesday, Wednesday, and then they speed it up again on Thursday. <laughs> they, they, they fool yeah, you. They yeah. fool you. <laughs> and I've heard they water the front fronts of the greens too to trick you, but who knows whether that's true or not. How's Jasper playing, by the way? Yeah, he did well today. I mean, nothing nothing flashy. The driver was a little off. We went and tinkered with that a little on the range. Mm-hmm. Um, and as you know, that's very important here. Oh, but he's feeling good, mate. He's, he, I mean, just the excitement, as you know, for a 21-year-old or 22-year-old is yeah, is next level. And you never get sick of seeing that in- excitement in someone, do you? No. I, and uh, Well, if you can even, you know, Larry Myers, we'll try and get him to play with him in a practice round. He'll teach him the greens. And, 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 <laughs> well, and he's the, not playing. And, oh, he's, he's not, not playing. Yeah, last, oh, last year was last, his last, last one. Last year was his last oh, year. Bugger. No, he's done. Last year was his last one, yeah. No, well, I would have gone there immediately. Yeah. It would have been unbelievable. I had Crenshaw um, for a practice round, and then, oh, and and then the first man. two days, it was the best thing I've ever seen on the greens. It was Amazing. incredible. Yeah, and he would have been open and and beautiful with you as yeah. he as he is for sure. Hey, Clarky, thank you so much for joining us, mate. We really appreciate no all, worries. all of your insights. Uh, Mitch, who sent us the uh, email at the start, thank you, Mitch. Mm. Uh, my advice to you, mate, is look up uh, on the PGA of Australia website, find some pro ams, get there on the Monday, uh, and just uh, you know the names that you know, just walk straight up to them and say, "Do you need a caddy today?" Mm. You only need one guy to say yes. If you enjoy it, away you go. You never know, you might be caddying for that person at the Australian Open. Um, or, or at least uh, even at the Australian Open week, just turn up on the Monday like I used to, wait inside the front gate and just ask players, do they need a caddy this week? Clarky, good luck this week. Yeah, there's not enough caddies. <laughs> need more caddies. Good luck this week with Jasper Stubbs. Boys, uh, uh, fingers crossed we're going to have a fantastic Augusta week. Brilliant. Thanks, Clarky. Appreciate it. Cheers, mate. No worries. Great to speak to you both. See you, boys. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. See ya. Thanks for being part of Talk Birdie to me with Nick O'Hearn and Mark Allen. And if you want to be part of the show, drop us a message or comment on the socials. Or you can send an email or leave a voicemail at talkbirdietome.com.au.
Thanks to the great team at Ping, they're the best in the business and they'll help you play your best. And the Golf Clearance Outlet. If you're after top quality at prices you won't beat, check them out. Golfclearanceoutlet.com.au Talk Birdie to Me's executive producer is Dan Bradley at Kaizen Media. Sound design, Daryl Misson at loudzebra.com. <laughs>